service this evening, turning your hymnal to number 85, and then you uh, get there if you'd stand. <clears throat> And it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ make thee whole. Arise, make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt in Lydda 
and Saren saw him and turned to the Lord. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. As we walk through this book, we thank you for the encouragement that it is, that it shows us, again, this reality, this truth of the moving of the Holy Spirit. As that Holy Spirit came and indwelt men, and those men, full of the Holy Spirit of God, turned the world upside down. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. It encourages us that we too have that very same Holy Spirit indwelling in us. And that God, the power of that Spirit can use us also to reach out and touch lives and see men and women, boys and girls, come to Christ. God, we thank you for this. We pray you just be with your word tonight. May it go forth with power. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Back up just as we were finishing Saul of Tarsus. If you remember as we began chapter 9, where was Saul? It's in verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing up threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he found any of this way, those were followers of Christ, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. That's how it starts the story in chapter 9 concerning Saul. How did we end that last week? And so as we, we will back up uh, to uh, verse 30, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea, sent him forth to Tarsus. Then when the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. When Saul received Christ, when this one who had been breathing out threatenings he had gone to the high priest and got warrants for the arrest of those in Damascus. He was traveling on that road when Jesus Christ, that light of Christ, shined upon him. And he immediately realized, Lord. And he begins to point out who this is and the reality of what had just happened. And Jesus said, is it not hard for thee to kick against the pricks? Listen, you've been kicking against those sharp pricks because he knew. Saul sat at the feet of the greatest minds of Israel in all, all the time he was growing up. And he knew the Old Testament. He knew all of this information. But he had been convinced that Jesus Christ was a false Messiah and that it must be stamped out, that crucifying him was the right thing to do. And now these crazy followers of a dead man, they had, this had to be stopped. But he also had to have known, as we touched on last week, wait a minute, what about everything that was said about him raising from the dead? What about when he was crucified and the graves opened? And when he rose from the dead, they came out of the graves and walked through time. What about that knowledge? He had that knowledge. He heard about all those things happening but he still had steeled himself against the truth of the Messiah of Israel. He was siding, again, with the high priest. He was siding with the religious of Israel. And so now, as he's on his way, continuing to persecute the church, suddenly the very one whom he had been denying reveals himself to him. As Dan pointed out in Sunday school class this morning, uh, this reality, how, how did they become apostles? You know, how, how, did, how did this happen? Well, they had to have, what, seen Christ. And they also had to have seen, what, the risen mm -hmm. Lord. This is how Paul became an apostle on the road to Damascus. He saw Jesus Christ revealed himself to Saul of Tarsus, which now put him in that same place where he literally could be called an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here, he's chasing them. He's done all of these things. Jesus Christ has revealed himself to him. He goes on into the city. Cornelius comes to him, lays his hands on him. The scales fall from his eyes. Immediately, what does he do? Starts preaching. Starts, well, no, 
First, he did something else. First, he ate. Yes. Then he did what? Got baptized. Saved, baptized. <laughs> then he started preaching. And, and, and just that reality of exactly what Jesus Christ had done for him. And I may go, well, wait a minute. This guy wasn't saved. How did he? Hey, he knew the Old Testament scriptures. He knew about the coming Messiah. He knew all of those things. So immediately upon being saved, he could argue the fact that Jesus Christ was, in fact, the Messiah sent from God. And so, again, he begins preaching there in Damascus at first, then back to Jerusalem. So now the church, as it says there in that last, at verse 31, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified there being built up in the Lord, walking in the fear of the Lord, in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. Amen. Now instead of the church being chased and scattered and all those things happening, now they're once again able to come back together without fear. And begin to be edified, to be built up in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we shift gears, beginning in verse 32. We shift to Peter. We've been talking about Saul or Paul, and, and now we shift. And it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters. Peter is visiting all the churches. He's passed throughout all quarters. He came down also to the saints who dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. This is a sick man. And seemingly everybody in that area knows this man, and they know this problem. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise, and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt in Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. This is why Jesus Christ gave the apostles and other disciples, this power. They had power to heal. They had power to do miracles. They had to, to do what? What was the reason that he would give them this power? To authenticate the New Testament truth. Exactly. He's authenticated the fact that things have now changed. The book of Acts, always remember, we don't build theology on the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a transitional book from what? The law to grace. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's transitioning. It's moving from what was to what is. Listen, when we come through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then come into Acts, before the cross, before the crucifixion, we're still under the what? Law. They're still under the law. It was post-cross, after the crucifixion. Now we're under grace. This is talking about that beginning, that wonder of suddenly the law is being set aside and the grace and the glory of Jesus Christ is being shared with a lost and a dying world. And people are confessing their sins, receiving Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, and their lives are changing completely. Amen. What once was is no more. But behold, all things become new. And so this reality is taking place, and it's taking place in the lives of thousands of people. And so here, Peter, as he is traveling, he's visiting the churches in all quarters, it says there. He finds this man, Aeneas, eight years with the palsy. So he simply tells him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ healed, healed thee. Arise, and it's interesting. You know, why didn't he just say arise and, and, and follow Christ? He says, arise and do what? Make your bed. <laughs> you know, what are we telling that for? Uh, the man hadn't been able to make his bed for eight years. Mm -hmm. He hadn't been able to deal with anything like that for eight years. He wanted to be sure that not only did the people see him arise, but they also saw him do what? Something physical. Something that he couldn't do before this time. Again, that is something that solidifies the reality of the healing. Amen. And when these people see that, and again, they've heard They've heard about the things that are going on. They've heard about Christ. They've heard about, even if you say, well, that was just rumors. You know, and, and, and a lot of people, when you're hearing things, and it may be absolute truth, but you haven't seen it. Okay? 
okay? Uh, and many, many times I, I'm told things, and a lot of times my response is, we'll see. <laughs> you know, uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I want to see how this works out, right? Um, well, I'm sure these people had heard. Uh, they've been challenged, possibly even, but now they've seen it work. Now they've seen the truth. Now they've seen the reality. And suddenly they are saying, this is the Savior of the world. This is the one who has come to Israel, to the Jew first, then the Gentile. And in verse 36, now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is Dorcas. Uh, this woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. I think this is very, very interesting again because she is known and she is greatly loved because she's simply going as Jesus. Said, what would Jesus go about doing? What about doing good? Here's one of his followers, Dorcas. So she's just simply going about doing good. Uh, she was full of good works and alms deeds, works of mercy, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in the upper chamber. This is an interesting thing, because if you, if you look back at Jewish customs of this time, you were laid out. You were taken, they would have been, she'd been washed, she'd have been wrapped, and she'd have been buried. They did not hold bodies over. And so this, this is a little bit of a, a little bit different. Uh, than would normally have been done. And so, but they take her, they wash her, they laid her in an upper chamber, for as much as Lydda was nigh unto Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men desiring him that he would not delay and come to them. Again, this is very unusual. Then Peter arose, went with them, and when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. I think the interesting thing is, you look and say, well, why was it all widows? Because those were the ones she was taking care of. Their husbands had died. And now, what? those who had a husband, whose responsibility was their clothes, their clothes, all those, that was the husband. He was to take care of them. But these had no husband. And Dorcas went about doing these good works for them. And so we see here the widow stood by him weeping and showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth, put them out, and, kneel, and kneel, kneeled down and prayed and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. She opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand, lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon the Tanner. Once again, God is revealing to mankind the power of, of Jesus Christ. Amen. Even the power of Jesus Christ, the miraculous power of Jesus Christ through his disciples. These who have believed, who have put their faith and trust in him, have risked their lives, have, flee, have fled Jerusalem at first. They're scattered abroad, but what are they doing as they're scattered abroad? Preaching Christ. I mean, this is the wonder of all of this. They, they are so persecuted in Jerusalem that they have to flee for their lives. But yet in fleeing, and you would think, uh, listen, when we get to wherever they're fleeing to, uh, we're just going to keep our mouth shut about Jesus, right? I mean, okay, you know, they run us out of the last place. No, everywhere they went, they're preaching Christ. And now... They're, they no doubt, because it calls, it said they sent for the saints. So there were already saints in Joppa. And so this reality, the saints go, they, they, go, they go get him. They bring him back. And as he comes, and he comes in the room, 
he kneels down, he prays, and then he turns to heaven. He said, Arise. Her eyes open. She sits up. This is an amazing thing. Amen. They know that she is dead. And one of the things that I think that, that they point out here is as they are, as she dies, they prepare her for burial. They wash her body. They prepare her for burial. These women all know she's dead. She's stone cold dead. They've prepared the body. So there's no question. There's no argument about this. She's dead. And so when Peter goes in, kneels down, prays, calls her name, she sits up, he gives her a hand, and she stands up. And he presents her then to those there alive. Amen. What a testimony of the power of Jesus Christ, even through his disciples who are simply obedient. How many? And, and again, I realize that this is, again, this is that transitional time that we've been talking about. And, and this is a time where they are proving the church. They're proving that this is true. They're proving that this direction is the power of God. And so they have this authority. They have this miraculous healing power and even raising people from the dead that they might see their need for Jesus Christ. What people see today is the change of our lives. Mm -hmm. They need to see that, behold, all things have become new. They need to see that we have, what, repented. We've changed our mind. We were going the direction of Satan, and now suddenly we've changed, and we're going the direction of Christ. This life has changed. We were dead, dead in trespasses and sins. Now we're alive unto Jesus Christ. Amen. We have been taken from death unto life, and it's eternal. Amen. We possess, we have eternal life in Jesus Christ. The change in our lives. And I realize there's some people, I'll tell you, you know, they've just been good people. They've been good kids. They grew up. They were good people. They walk, and then they get saved. Was there sin in their lives? Of course, there was sin in their lives. But they were good folks. And and, and you look at their lives, and and there isn't as much to see to say, "Wow, look what God did in their lives." But I want to tell you something. That's the kind of life I want to see. You know, there there was. I remember way back when we first got saved. And I was listening to a number of, of tapes, preaching tapes and those kinds of things. And there was a guy traveling around at that time as an evangelist. And he had been a murderer. And he had been sent to prison. And again, his testimony was only through the power of God that he ultimately was allowed to, to be released. And he had been saved in prison. And he got out of prison. He's going about but again, he's going in and his testimony is this testimony of absolute wickedness. This vile, wicked, wretched man, a murderer. That's not the kind of testimony I want to hear. Yes, that was an amazing thing. That God saved that man. And I'll tell you what, I would rather any day hear the testimony of somebody who says, you know what, I've never drank. I've never done drugs. I've never, all of these different terrible things that are out there. Um, a family member, um, again, had to go through a bunch of different testing and, and things for a job uh, that he had. And they came and said, well, have you ever smoked pot? No. Come on. No. No, I never did. Really. You ever drank alcohol? It's all right. You can be honest. No. No, I've never done that. People asking those kind of questions in the society in which we live in today, they don't believe you. Okay? They just think everybody 
No, I want to hear the testimony of somebody who would just say, you know, I've never done that. I got saved at a young age. That's what I really like to hear. I got saved at a young age, and you know what? I've just never done those things. I've just never been interested in those kind of things. You see, that's a great testimony. That testimony of, yeah, I was involved in every vile, wicked, horrible thing that was out there, and then I became a murderer. But God saved me. Amen. That's great that God saved this man. But I'd rather hear a testimony that I never did any of those things. And God saved me. You know, that, that, that's what I would rather, again, hear. But walking through what these men did, how God empowered them, how God changed their lives. Listen, Jesus Christ, when he first calls the disciples, who does he call? Some rough fishermen. Follow me. Listen, those guys were known to be pretty rough around the edges. But yet, they see Christ, they recognize the Messiah of Israel, and they follow him. Amen. That's a changed life. That is where we just simply come in, and God has completely done a great and wondrous work in our lives. Peter here, as he is there in Joppa, and it says here, and it came to pass at last, verse, verse 43, that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. Boy, listen, he stayed there. And, and again, what, what, what are they doing? Why, why is he? He's not just, just taking a vacation. He's teaching. He's preaching. He's, he's, he's edifying the saints. And then we'll just quickly just step into the first couple of verses here of chapter 10. And that's where we'll pick up and start next week. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw a vision, uh, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose name is Peter. God has further work for Peter to do. Sometimes, as believers, we miss the call. These are miraculous calls. I mean, when an angel comes... <laughs> You know, reveals of this pretty miraculous call. But we too have calls on our lives. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we are called to go different places, leave where we are, leave where we're comfortable, leave where we're, we're, we're getting to become friends. And then God says, you know what? I need you to come over here. I need you to go into ministry. I need you to go in missions. I need you to go to your neighbor." I need to do things that maybe are uncomfortable for us. We need to be ready, just as the apostles, just as Peter. When the call comes, we need to be ready to say, what? Yes. Yes. Hear my Lord. Send me. So often, so many have missed it. I've been in the ministry long enough and I've been saved long enough to have known people that I saw the call of God in their lives. Mm -hmm. I saw them serious about God, starting to move towards that, filling that call of God and then have something come up and it's almost always the same thing that comes up and gets in the way. Mm -hmm. Money. All, the, that's, yeah, all of a sudden God provides this great job or God the devil provides this great job with good money and benefits and just, man, you know, all these things. And they look at that and go, well, should I do this? Or what? Yeah, but look at this. And they start getting confused. The call of God to ministry and then suddenly a call, a call you know, which I would say is from the devil, to do something exactly the opposite. With good money, good benefits, all of those things and watch those people say, I'm going to do that. Or instead of preparing for ministry, 
I'm going to prepare for a really good paying job and rather than ministry they chase the job and I've seen those, those lives destroyed because I've had the opportunity to watch them over the years how sad how sad to miss the call of God and do anything less than the call of God on your life listen when we look at the apostles and we look at God's call on them and how he called them originally, how they followed through on that call. And historically, we're told all but John, all but John were killed. Mm -hmm. All but John were martyrs. And John, it is said, they, they tried to kill and couldn't. And so they, why, they put him on the Isle of Patmos. You know, they exiled him away from everybody else and because, okay, there, now he can't do anything. God gives him what? The revelation. God always has a plan. Always has a plan. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the time that we've had here in Acts, finishing up chapter 9, looking forward to chapter 10 next week, or the week after, actually, uh, as we just walk through the book of Acts. This wonderful transitional book, a, a book of history about the church and where it got started, how it got started, and how it spread. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for these things. And thank you for them all. In Jesus' name.